my name is Josh. I'm here on behalf of the Alpha Missense team to present uh, today's webinar on Alpha Missense predictions for human genetic variation research. So there are a few components to today's webinar. Um, the objectives of this component are twofold, to describe the principles behind Alpha Missense and how it works, and to identify how Alpha Missense utilizes protein structure and sequence information for variant assessment. I'll be presenting four different parts. First, a quick overview of the method, talking then about some design principles, we're discussing some of the evaluations we performed on the method, and finally, sort of a user's guide on, on how you can approach using these scores. Google DeepMind is a unit uh, inside of Google uh, whose mission is to build AI responsibly to benefit humanity. And as part of that mission, we have a group dedicated to science applying AI and machine learning to fundamental science problems. Uh, one such problem is the problem of genome variant interpretation. And there are many different kinds of genetic variants. Uh, the focus of today's uh, webinar will be on missense variants. So just a quick definition, a missense variant is a variant that affects a protein by changing a reference amino acid to an alternate amino acid. And mechanistically, this is going to happen um, when a nucleotide letter is uh, changed, for example, CAG coding for Q, and that can be flipped, which can change it to start coding for R. So this is an example of a missense variant. Why is it important to interpret missense variants? Uh, that comes down to the fact that missense variants can either be pathogenic or benign. So again, to go over some definitions, a pathogenic missense variant is one that disrupts protein function and can often lead to disease. Whereas a benign missense variant is one that is gonna have a limited effect. And it's important to distinguish between these two. Uh, clinicians have meticulously uh, curated a set of missense variants and other variants in a database called ClinVar. And this ClinVar database contains information about uh, a, a case, a patient that presents with a particular missense variant that has been identified as either being pathogenic, causing some kind of disease, or perhaps benign. And these are highly um, sort of uh, annotated and, and, and uh, ground truth labels, but there's a very small number of them compared to the number of possible missense variants. So humans have about 20,000 proteins, an average protein is about 300 amino acids, and each amino acid can be flipped to 19 other uh, amino acid choices. And so that creates a large space and essentially there's a knowledge gap for what those other missense variants might be doing. Alpha missense is a method that uh, is intended to address this gap. And at the highest level, the input to alpha missense is a missense variant as we just described. So again, this is going to be uh, an amino acid position in a protein sequence that has been changed to a different amino acid. That's the input of, of alpha missense. The output is going to be a score. The score ranges from zero to one, and zero represents uh, something closer to benign, while one represents something closer to pathogenic. And so the point of this method is to return these scores for a variety of different missense variants. Now, one of the key use cases uh, of the model is that it can be scaled up. So it can be scaled to the space of all possible um, sort of proteome-wide missense variants. And, and we'll discuss a little bit about um, that database that was generated and how that could be useful for your research. So that's the high-level overview of missense in a nutshell. Let's address some of the design principles uh, behind the method itself. And I'll start with a pretty high-level question, which is, why is machine learning an appropriate choice for this problem? Uh, folks who are machine learning practitioners, especially in biology, uh, you know, may understand the challenge of this setup. Uh, not every problem in biology is suitable for machine learning. Sometimes the data is not good enough, or sometimes the inductive biases aren't strong enough. In this case, um, this kind of problem is actually quite suitable for machine learning for a variety of reasons. The first is that the task is very clear. Once again, the input is a variant. The output is a score or a sort of a class label, benign or pathogenic. And this kind of classification setup is very amenable to machine learning. Another critical component is that there are clear metrics which can be used to grade candidate models. 
So as I introduced earlier, there's this very valuable database, ClinVar. And if you had a model, let's say, and it made a prediction, you could grade that model's prediction against the ClinVar database to see how well your model is agreeing with a clinician's opinion. And that's a very, very valuable evaluation um, for this kind of setting. As an alternative, there are actually experimental methods called deep mutational scans. And these come about when molecular biologists are studying a particular gene or protein, and they systematically mutate that protein to generate what's called a library. And then they subject that library of mutants to certain biochemical assays, uh, intending to learn more about the protein's function. Those are kind of an alternative source of evidence to understand how your model's doing in this sort of experimental setting. Finally, there's a very clear impact, as I introduced already. Um, a method that does well at this task can help fill in the gaps in an important database. And finally, and this is going to deserve a little bit more attention in the next few slides, um, but there are clear inductive biases um, that inform uh, potential solutions for this kind of problem. So let's jump into um, the next following slides, uh, which are um, going to address sort of the learning principle, uh, the learning objectives of this webinar. So an inductive bias, you can think of this as a principle or an assumption that you can make to help you more successfully um, perform at, the, at this task. And there are three roughly important inductive biases that guided alpha missenses design as a method. The first inductive bias is that protein context matters. So what does that mean? A missense variant like this Q to R mutation, without understanding what's going on outside of that, um, like the Q and R is not enough to determine whether that change is going to be pathogenic. You need to look at the sequence in which this change is occurring. Um, the other thing that's important to know also is the shape of the protein in which that change is occurring. So at that position, if um, that change is occurring on a very important site structurally in the protein, let's say it's near an enzymatic uh, active site, um, that may inform your decision about whether a change at that residue should be pathogenic or not. So you can use both protein context in terms of sequence and structure uh, to deeply inform um, how you might predict uh, a missense variant to be pathogenic or benign. The next inductive bias to take into account is protein evolutionary history. So anyone who studied a human protein and looked at maybe an ortholog in yeast or flies or worms and compared which residues are, are the same or which ones have changed uh, probably has an intuition for this already, which is that amino acids that are deeply conserved across evolution tend to be important for protein function. And ultimately any change to those amino acids uh, might be interpreted to be more pathogenic or more, um, more influential for organismal fitness. On the contrary, any residue that seems to be changing quite um, fluidly across an uh, evolutionary tree uh, might be interpreted as being more closely to being benign. So once again, you can use information about protein evolutionary history to guide um, your solution to this task. And finally, the third one is more of a data-driven inductive bias, which takes advantage of the fact that there have been uh, many large-scale sequencing efforts that have provided sort of an overview of the observed sequence variation in humans. And so these databases can now be hundreds of thousands or even a million um, sample size in terms of sample size, which is number of individuals. And these individuals have been subjected to um, sort of DNA sequencing. And so they, um, you can basically look at the frequency of different kinds of uh, missense variants that are present or absent in human populations and use that as well to guide your intuition as to whether um, a variant should be pathogenic or not. And to make this super clear, if you can observe in a, in a large number of individuals a missense variant, um, you might assume that it's benign, whereas if you cannot observe in any individual a certain variant that might be something closer to pathogenic. So now that I've introduced these three inductive biases, let's really walk through 
how these inter, uh, inductive biases are introduced into the model. So this is kind of the ingredients under the hood of alpha missense. The first thing to know is that alpha missense is, uh, is an adaptation of another method called AlphaFold2, which was also developed by Google DeepMind. AlphaFold2 takes as input a protein sequence, and it returns its structure. And it's able to make this predicted structure because it's been trained on hundreds of thousands of experimentally derived protein structures uh, in a database called PDB. And so this is an incredibly powerful starting point for a method like alpha missense, because AlphaFold2, in the way that it's been trained, has already learned a lot about the sequence to structure relationship in proteins. And hopefully, that capability is going to be useful um, as an inductive bias for solving this um, missense uh, classification problem. Now, under the hood, AlphaFold2 is a modular system with many components, uh, not just that structure prediction component, actually. And um, this is not that widely known. And one of its components actually has the task of predicting the likelihood of amino acids that ought to belong in hidden entries in a multiple sequence alignment of the input protein. So let's walk through that a little bit. A multiple sequence alignment is a table where every row is a species, and every column is a position on a, an amino acid sequence. So when you put a protein sequence into AlphaFold, the first thing that happens is a multiple sequence alignment database is queried, and this table is brought up. So every entry in this table is just the amino acid that's at that position in the multiple sequence alignment. Now, what happens under the hood is that some of these positions are actually masked out or hidden from the model. And the model is challenged to recover which amino acids ought to have been in those hidden positions. And by training the model to do this, it actually learns the statistics of protein evolutionary history. And it's able to do this task because patterns across species and patterns across positions can actually inform sort of the um, amino acid identities that ought to be in these hidden entries. And if you're paying close attention, this kind of task actually starts to sound a little bit like protein, uh, like a missense variant classification. Because given uh, a position that's been hidden, and let's say, oh, you know, it's very likely that these five amino acids should be here maybe those amino acid changes are going to be more close to benign because they're more consistent with uh, protein evolutionary history. Whereas amino acids that seem statistically unlikely to be in those positions, those could be um, more pathogenic, for example, or more rare, at least. So these are two components of AlphaFold2 that bring in these valuable inductive biases that are then used in alpha missense. OK, now the third component, um, I'm going to introduce a little bit more about what makes alpha missense alpha missense rather than alpha fault. So there are, major, there are two major components to alpha missense worth discussing in this context. The first is that alpha missense is trained as alpha fault 2 in a pre-training stage with this component that learns the statistics of protein evolutionary history uh, upweighted in terms of its importance. So the importance of this task relative other, uh, to other tasks is heightened. After that training step is completed, it then enters a fine tuning stage in which this third inductive bias, this human sequence variation, is introduced. And the way that that's introduced is that this fine tuning stage adds an additional challenge, which is that given a human, now we're going to focus on human proteins, right? So given a human protein, and then given a position within that human protein, classify whether that position ought to be present or absent in the human population, given what you've seen about these um, uh, uh, human, sequ human sequence variations uh, that you can be trained on. So to make this more explicit, each position on this human protein that's masked is going to be either present in a human population based on some database or absent from that database. And by training the model to actually pick up on those presences and absences, this fine tuning stage uh, makes alpha missense more capable 
at predicting specifically human pathogen, uh, missense variant pathogenicity. This stage is actually called weak supervision because as you can tell, this is kind of a proxy for pathogenicity, but it does help on the actual um, benchmarks that I'm about to show. So after these three training stages are complete and these three inductive biases are introduced into the model, evaluation occurs by grading the model against ClinVar um, to assess performance. And it's important to note that actually the variants that are present in ClinVar, right, these really nice annotated variants, those are actually excluded from that previous step I was talking about. Um, so the model is actually not trained on ClinVar data directly. Um, it's only evaluated on ClinVar. Okay, so that's um, an in-depth overview of the design principles behind Alpha Missense. Um, and there's actually gonna be resources shared after the webinar for those who want to learn more about the machine learning. There are some helpful talks that we'll send you. But for now, let's move on into evaluation and understanding how these predictions hold up against different sources of ground truth. So here I'm gonna present the results on two benchmarks. Um, if you look at the published paper, there are more um, evaluations that you can look at as well. But the one on the left is this ClinVar evaluation in which the models that are shown have been graded uh, by how well they agree with ClinVar annotations on real sort of um, clinically observed uh, missense variants. On the right is the results of a uh, correlation basically with experimental assays that have probed these mutations on human proteins. And so this is sort of a basket of human proteins um, that have been subjected to mutational studies. And so you can use your model and compare them to those um, experiments. On the x-axis of each plot is a measure of agreement. And on the y-axis are the names of models that have been tested on these benchmarks and they've been ranked by performance. And so in the development of this method, it was reassuring to see that Alpha Missense was performing strongly on both of these different benchmarks. I'll note that on the left, there are some models in gray. So those gray models have actually been trained on ClinVar directly. So as I emphasized earlier, Alpha Missense wasn't trained on ClinVar. Um, these methods are, and that actually does help significantly on this ClinVar evaluation. But when you switch context to these experimental assays, um, those models don't perform as well, meaning that they've been trained in a way that picks up on potentially certain biases in ClinVar um, that, that damage its performance um, outside of that setting. Um, so that's why it's important to always keep in mind multiple different benchmarks when you're looking at these kinds of models. So far, we've been talking really at a global scale. Let's, let's kind of zoom in for a moment, let's say on a particular protein and see how these scores might inform your interpretation of what this protein uh, it sort of is doing. So ACV RL1 is a protein that's been nominated to be clinically actionable. And the criteria for this is that, um, you know, there are lots of patients that show up with mutations, missense mutations on this particular protein. So on this plot, on the x-axis, you can see uh, the number of uh, an amino acid position so there are about 500 amino acids in this particular protein. On the y-axis, you see the score, which is actually returned by alpha missense. I introduced this early in the webinar, but this score ranges from zero to one. You see a few thresholds as well that are uh, horizontal lines. I'll talk about how those were de derived in a bit. But above that red line means pathogenic, and then below that blue line means benign. And finally, what you're gonna see are these um, filled in circles that are quite large. Those are the variants that are actually present in this ClinVar database that I introduced. And so what you can see is that um, based on these ClinVar annotated labels, um, the alpha missense method is agreeing quite well with uh, what clinicians um, annotated in, in, in real uh, clinical observations. Um, what you can also see behind those dots are sort of these faded um, data points. Those are variants that were predicted by alpha missense and their pathogenicity was scored, but those variants don't show up in ClinVar. And so you can kind of see the value of filling in the gaps for this particular protein, let's say, and having a more complete picture 
of the potential pathogenicity of, of all the possible variants that are present in this protein, not just the ones that are clinically annotated. On the right, there's a protein structure. This is a predicted structure actually from AlphaFold database. And what has happened here is that each residue on that particular protein has been colored by the average pathogenicity of um, the 19 possible missense variants uh, on that particular position. And uh, this kind of plot is interesting because it helps you uh, compare the structure to what's on the left. And in general, what you see is that um, sort of globular, well-folded domains seem to be more pathogenic, meaning that any alteration uh, could have like a larger effect. Whereas domains that are a little bit more disordered or potentially transmembrane domains seem more benign, which means alterations there might be less likely to have an effect. So um, when we talk to people who are studying alpha missense, uh, often there are questions about these scores. So I'm dedicating a slide here just specifically to this zero to one score and answering a few frequently asked questions. So what does this score actually mean? It's between zero and one. Um, you can interpret it sort of the same way that you interpret your weather app. So if your weather app says 80% chance of rain, that means that if you scroll back in time and look at other days that were annotated as 80% chance of rain, your expectation as a user should be that eight of those days were rainy and then two of them happened not to be. So these scores work quite the same way, except um, in this case, obviously we're talking about ClinVar. So a score of 0.8 implies that for 10 other potential missense variants that score in that range, you should expect when you look up their answers in uh, well, their labels in ClinVar that eight of them will say pathogenic or likely pathogenic, whereas two of them would say something else, um, either uncertain or likely benign. So how do these scores actually get to this scale, like between zero and one? Um, the model output is actually not on this scale natively. Um, it was transformed uh, to this zero to one scale using a logistic regression classifier uh, that was trained on a set of ClinVar validation variants. And you can see the result of that classification calibration on the upper right. Finally, how were these clash thresholds drawn? So oftentimes you'll be interacting with these numerical scores. Sometimes you'll also see them labeled as likely benign, uncertain, or likely pathogenic. So those labels were derived um, by cutoffs that were drawn to achieve 90% uh, precision. So the likely benign class is this threshold between you know, below 0.34. Um, and those predictions, the ones that are below 0.34, have a 90% negative class precision, which means that 90% of those variants that are labeled this way, um, if you look them up in ClinVar, um, they have that sort of benign label in ClinVar. The same thing is true for likely pathogenic. So anything above the sort of 0.56 threshold was labeled likely pathogenic to achieve a 90% positive class precision. Uh, one thing to note is that these labels were chosen to match the ClinVar naming conventions. However, they should not be directly interpreted as equivalent to ACMG labels. Um, so ACMG labeled variants require uh, multiple sources of different kinds of evidence. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about how to deal with informatic evidence in clinical uh, research in, in, an, in a further slide. Okay, so that was a lot of technical details. Um, essentially, at the end of the day, the thing that you're gonna probably want to interact with are these proteome-wide predictions. So after all this benchmarking was complete and we gained some confidence about this model's performance, uh, we then proceeded to make um, 600 million predictions of different missense variants and their pathogenicities. And this set of predictions covers all amino acid substitutions and missense variants in 20,000 canonical gene isoforms as well as 60,000 alternate alternative isoforms. So these would be splice isoforms of your favorite, I'm um, sorry, of your favorite proteins. And this increased the coverage of confident predictions due to the better performance of this model relative to other models. And so this is the final result um, of sort of filling in the knowledge gap um, using these kinds of cutoffs that I introduced earlier. Okay, so now we're gonna enter um, the part of the talk where we're gonna learn about how to use these scores. 
And um, this is going to be a little bit more in depth and more for users from different settings. And I'm going to try to address those different settings um, in different parts of this um, section. So how should I reason about these scores? Um, if you're a clinical researcher, our hope is actually that these scores will feel quite familiar. Um, so these scores for genetic variants are going to be available or, or are available via familiar portals, such as VEP or VEP or Decipher. And there's already a lot of existing thinking and guidelines around the use of informatic evidence in clinical settings. And those guidelines should inform your use of alphamissense, just as it would with any other predictive approach. So these scores are a research tool. We hope they're, they're useful for your research. Um, and ultimately, they should be used alongside other sources of evidence when drawing scientific conclusions. Uh, and they certainly don't substitute um, sort of prof professional medical advice or diagnoses. Um, in particular, um, different papers have come out benchmarking alpha missense um, on specific research use cases, and it's always really exciting to see those results. So if you're a clinical researcher and you have a set of confidently labeled variants that um, you understand really well, I encourage you to try to use those scores to understand how alpha missense might be performing for your particular research setting. So if you're a molecular biologist, um, this crowd might take a little bit more convincing um, because uh, these kinds of scores um, haven't been super widely available in the past. So I recommend three different levels of granularity when you're approaching these scores from the point of view of a molecular biology researcher. The first and probably maybe the most common use case is when you walk in with a particular protein that you're really interested in studying and you want to understand kind of the picture of all the potential missense variants and how pathogenic they would be on, on your protein of interest. And uh, there's a really nice uh, visualization that I would recommend, which is that you can take each residue position and you can put that on the X and you can have each of the 20 possible amino acids on the Y. You know, there would be one reference amino acid and 19 alternative amino acids in that plot. And you can plot that as a heat map of these zero to one scores. Um, I also recommend these individual protein position averages. So again, kind of taking that heat map and collapsing it down by taking the average of those 19 possible missense variants for each position. Um, and these are especially interesting when you can combine them with protein structures, either measured ones or predicted ones, to aid in your interpretation of these results. And I'll actually take these first two points um, and, and use a vignette uh, that we developed as part of the paper um, to show you how this could be done. Um, in this case, we're going to focus on a protein called SHOCK2. So a brilliant postdoc, uh, Jason Kwan, was studying SHOCK2 because it's an important cancer gene. Um, and he developed an assay where he mutagenized every possible amino acid in SHOCK2 to every other possible amino acid. So it's a saturating mutagenesis, mutagenesis screen. And then he took that library and he subjected them to a fitness assay. So how well do they recover cancer cell fitness in a certain setting? So the results of his experiments are shown here. On the X are the 200, first 200 amino acids of shock 2 On the Y, again, are these 20 amino acids um, that were you know, mutated. Or sorry, the, the 20 alternate, you know, the, 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 the 20 alternate amino acids for each position. And then on, uh, there, it was reassuring at the time to see experimentally that this kind of uh, result was lining up well with known and some unknown domain annotations for this protein, which are shown above in these uh, colored boxes. So here now we're overlaying the alpha missense scores. Again, these are scores ranging from 0 to 1, uh, where 1 is more pathogenic. And it's laid out in exactly the same way as Jason's experiment. And sort of broadly, you can see um, that certain residue level patterns um, reoccur in the alpha missense uh, predictions that were experimentally derived. Um, in particular, these domain annotations seem to be popping up as pathogenic in both the experiment and the prediction. And finally, just to quickly compare to other kinds of methods, such as EVE, um, that might suffer from some limitations, including uh, when you know proteins aren't super well conserved, those might be um, those might not result in a prediction at all, uh, or it might miss some of these kinds of interesting domains. 
So as part of his study, Jason actually performed an experiment where he crystallized or structurally resolved shock two um, in, in complex with two other uh, important proteins. And now this visualization is showing what I recommended earlier with each residue on the protein uh, represented as an average of all the 19 possible missense variants. Um, and so that score is shown again in, in, in the, between zero and one. And what you can see is that this aids in the interpretation of the plot on the left. So I'll bring your attention to this RBFX binding motif. This is a short linear interaction motif that binds, um, that part of shock two that binds PP1C. This is something actually that Jason discovered as part of his study, it wasn't known previously. And looking at the structure, it becomes kind of clear uh, why this region might not be tolerant to missense variation, because changing any one of these amino acids might disrupt this important interaction motif. Um, similarly, the body of shock 2 uh, contains a lot of these leucine-rich repeats, and their um, residues also interact with these proteins, and those residues also tend to be, on average, the most pathogenic, i.e., you don't want to change those residues either because it could interfere with this interface. So I was really excited when um, Enbol EBI reached out to beta test this AlphaFold database because that figure that I just showed you took a lot of effort and time, and now you can reproduce it with one click in this database. It's really amazing. So if you look up SHOP2 as an entry using its Uniprot ID, you'll be able to see visualizations like the one I just showed you, like these heat maps as well as these residue average pathogenicity uh, scores, which are painted on to predicted protein structures. And you can actually sort of zoom in interactively on the heat map, and you can even click on a particular missense variant. And that will highlight that residue position in the structure above. So it's, it's interactive in, in both of these panels. And so th this has been incredible work. So I'm really excited that um, this is now made public uh, for everyone to browse. So I'll end um, this sort of molecular biology recommendation with a, a third one, which is kind of the most coarse-grained one. But you can actually take just the average of all of the possible missense variants for that protein to get a single number. And so if you do this, you're going to end up with about 20,000 numbers, one for each protein. And this is a really coarse-grained uh, representation of, on average, how pathogenic any mutation in that protein is. But it turns out this is um, quite useful for estimating the importance of protein um, um, properties like cell fitness, for example. And so uh, a brilliant research scientist in the group, Claire Bycroft, discovered this. Um, here's a vignette about how you can use these scores. Um, on the left is a protein complex. It is a part of the spliceosome processing. Um, so it's very, very important, uh, both for human essentiality and cell growth. Um, however, some of the components of this complex are quite short. And the sort of state-of-the-art methods for estimating um, protein sort of intolerance to loss of function uh, rely on the presence or absence of variants across the gene body. And if the protein or gene is really short, that creates that means that it's going to be underpowered for this kind of statistic. Um, however, what Claire found when you, she took these average um, pathogenicity scores is that it worked as quite a reasonable substitute um, for this kind of LUF score um, without having this kind of limitation. And so, you know, this is kind of a serendipitous result. Um, no one was really expecting this when starting the project, but we're really hoping that people, once they have access to these scores and learn how to use them, can come up with these kinds of interesting use cases. So we're almost near the end of this component. Um, it's time to address some of the limitations of this method um, that would help you guide um, sort of your research and your interpretations of these scores. So the first thing is that alpha missense shares some of the limitations of alpha fold 2. The first is that there is a length restriction. So proteins that are too long, uh, if you search those proteins, you may not find them in the alpha fold database or find them in the alpha missense scores. And the reasoning behind that is that there is a limitation for the method. So um, proteins that are too long just um, can't really um, be input correctly. There are also certain proteins that have non-comnonical amino acids as part of their reference sequence. And these two are not, are not going to come up with any scores. 
And finally, in general, AlphaFold2 was a system trained on predicting protein structure. And so it may lack context for certain other biomolecules that are important for protein function and ultimately pathogenicity, such as DNA and RNA, et cetera. The second set of limitations comes from the fact that the um, task is formulated as a classification or a prediction of this zero to one score. And that means that you're not gonna get information for some of the following things. So in the clinical setting or a clinical research setting, um, you may be curious about things like penetrance or haploinsufficiency, basically um, the genetic mechanisms of some of these missense variants. Or you may be interested in specific diseases or phenotypes and linking those to specific missense variants. Um, unfortunately, those aren't going to be informed by these scores um, because they're more of an app, like a they're more of a general um, estimation. And finally, alpha missense wasn't designed to handle epistasis or combinations of variants. Is really trained in this single missense variant setting. Um, in the molecular biology interpretation of these scores, um, one sort of frequently asked question is, oh, I have a particular missense variant I've been studying, and I want to know if it affects stability or not. So this is not something that these scores will directly inform you about, um, because the bio the, uh, it doesn't inform on specific biochemical mechanisms, for instance. Um, so if you see a pathogenic um, prediction for a particular missense variant, it'll require a little bit more work to figure out what the potential mechanism of that variant is. Um, however, there's been some active research in this, and you can look up, for example, databases like PROTBAR that are providing now um, stability predictions. Finally, if you're in this um, deep mutational scanning field or mutagenesis field, um, there's, uh, similarly, it doesn't, uh, the alpha missense scores themselves don't inform on particular kinds of biochemical readouts. I mean, this is a very similar limitation to what I mentioned previously, though the information can be complementary. So I encourage you, if you're starting out in a new mutagenesis experiment, uh, maybe take a look at these scores and see if that can help you design better libraries or make more um, deeply informed hypotheses. And finally, um, the structures of the proteins that contain these alternative amino acids are not returned as part of the model. Um, and so uh, that's, that's not one of the outputs of alpha missense. So other notes that I've sort of gleaned from the literature and conferences and things like that, um, gain of function variants tend to be challenging for these kinds of methods. Um, and alpha missense uh, is, is not an exception to that. And also the sort of calibration, uh, the, the, the sort of um, class labels were chosen based on thresholds that were globally sort of defined over the whole proteome. Um, if you have a particular use case, you may gain from actually um, tweaking those thresholds a little bit in your particular setting, especially if you have a really strong benchmark. And finally, um, alpha missense is not a software. The main artifact is a database. And so um, the next component of this webinar, you're gonna learn a lot about how to access these scores and use them. Okay, so one more thing. Um, we thought it'd be fun just to show you a little bit of the explorations that we've been doing with the new portal. Um, this is again, an amazing resource and I've had a lot of fun, uh, even though I helped work on the paper, just seeing these scores again in a different setting um, has really sparked some of my uh, interests. And I thought it'd be nice to show some of those with you. Now these are anecdotes, so they're not from the peer reviewed paper. Um, but they're more of a, a, a sort of a, a guide for folks who are interested in browsing um, the um, AlphaFold database. So yeah, if you look at these kinds of heat maps over time, you'll start to see certain patterns. So proteins like the ones on the left, a, a ribosome protein, seems to be very, very pathogenic. Any mutation is, uh, seems to be uh, not so good. And uh, proteins on the right, like an olfactory receptor, uh, tend to be more benign overall. Uh, and this is concordant with the fact that um, of, oh, there are many, many of olfactory receptors, some of which are redundant to each other. Uh, it gets kind of interesting when you see proteins like the ones in the middle that seem to have certain patterns um, embedded in their pathogenicity uh, predictions that seem to be based on like residue position. Um, and if you start to annotate these kinds of um, pathogenicity patterns, you start to see um, more examples of the, the sort of things I was showing you earlier with that shock 2 protein. So for example, this is a protein in which um, the left or the N-terminus part of this protein is actually disordered. 
Um, but there are certain regions of that disordered protein, uh, disordered part of the protein that seem to be at least predicted to be pathogenic by alpha missense. And some of them actually line up quite nicely um, with known protein-protein interaction motifs that um, others have studied on this N-terminus part of the protein. This is actually um, taken, these figures are taken from a review about this protein and other kinds of uh, proteins like this. Um, and in that review, they highlighted specific residues that they thought were super important for these protein-protein interactions. And it turns out that the alpha missense scores, if you sort of zoom in on these heat maps, line up quite nicely with these authors' intuition um, and tend to also line up as well with patterns of evolutionary conservation. So I encourage you to check out um, even the specific details of some of these pathogenic segments to see if they might spike your interest. And finally, I'll leave you with one more example. So um, some residues in the proteome are phosphorylated or in general, post-translationally modi modified. Uh, in particular, a phosphocyte introduces a negative charge onto that protein residue. And these, these phosphorylation events are important for signaling. If you look really closely at certain proteins, you'll start to see patterns like what I'm showing you on the left. And I've highlighted these sort of serine residues, S65, S70, um, on this particular protein, MAF1. And these are sites that seem to be pathogenic when you mutate that serine to a charged residue, like S to E or S to K. Um, and that's interesting because it kind of lines up with another study that was performed trying to identify these phosphocytes. Um, in this particular protein, again, they actually identified each of these serines as a target candidate, as candidate targets for phosphorylation. And so, you know, if you look really closely at these scores, I'm hoping that folks will start to discover um, interesting things about their favorite proteins and then tell us about it. But this brings us to the end of this component of the webinar. To summarize what you've learned, alpha missense is a fine-tuned version of AlphaFold that predicts the pathogenicity of missense variants. Um, it outperforms state-of-the-art methods on multiple diverse benchmarks and increases the number of confidently classified variants proteome-wide. And these predictions have now been made widely accessible, and you're about to learn more about how um, you can find them. If you enjoyed this talk and some of this work, um, please consider looking at the paper itself. Um, which is listed here. And I'll end on a warm set of acknowledgments of the, for the Alpha Missense team at Google DeepMind, and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Josh. That was great. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Paulina Magaña, and for this part of the webinar, I'll cover how we can, how we have in, integrated the data from Alpha Missense into different resources from Embol EBI. And I'm gonna briefly show you how you can access it. If there are any specific questions, we have delegates from different resources so you can ask them. So let's start with Ensemble. This is the genome browser which supports research in comparative genomics, evolution, sequence variation, and transcriptional regulation. Alpha Mises scores and the classifications have been in integrated into the Ensemble Variant Effect Predictor or VEP tool, which enables you to easily annotate the variants via their user-friendly web interface, the REST API, and the command line. When you use this tool, you can see the data related to a specific missense variant and is available only for canonical sequences. You can visualize the um, average pathogenicity scores from alpha missions for each residue on the predicted 3D protein structure, which is taken from the AlphaFold database. And you can see that in the 3D viewer. This is available from the associated Ensemble transcript page. And you can also switch views between variants, domains, exons, and toggle between the confidence metric, PLDT, and alpha missions uh, average scores to support interpretation for the different regions of the protein and their sensitivity to change. So now moving to Decipher. Decipher is a platform for phenotype-associated variant data sharing, and it contains 
data from over 48,000 patients who have given consent for data, for broad data sharing. It includes a suite of tools and visualizations, which can provide you more details on the genomic variants. You can see the alpha mutants scores and the pathogenicity classifications on the variant annotation pages alongside all the key data. So this is adding more value to the annotations that are already available on the cipher. And this is available for the human genome build 38 and for canonical transcripts. Moving now on to Unipro. Unipro is a comprehensive and freely available resource of protein sequences and functional information. And the alpha missions variance and score are displayed along with functional sites from the alpha fold local score, the PLDT, in the ProtVista, which is in interactive. You can zoom in and zoom out on specific regions or residues. And the alpha missions pathogenicity track is showing you the average score per residue. You can also inspect additional protein features and annotations coming from different resources for a more holistic analysis. So these scores, as Joshua mentioned, are classified into blue, which are likely benign, gray, which are um, biggest, and dark red, which are likely, likely pathogenic. You can download the, the data as a CSV file, and this includes all the possible amino acid substitution, individual pathogenicity scores, and the classifications from alpha missions. So now in PROTVAR, PROTVAR is a collaboration between UniProt and Open Target, which is another resource from Embol EBI. This resource integrates single nucleotide variation data from humans and present them with more functional annotations and variant predictors, predictors such as the um, delta delta G for the predicted stability change. And it now in, integrates the data from alpha missions and is showing you the um, average score per missions variants and the classification for those. If you have a list of human proteins with variants, you can also view the um, prediction for multiple variants where you're using PROTVA. And this data can also be downloaded from the PROTVA API. And lastly, the AlphaFold database, which provides access, open access to over 200 million predicted proteins from the AlphaFold 2 AI system. And this database is a collaboration with Google DeepMind. And on every entry page that we have, we provide the confidence metrics to assess the predicted structures and have now added the data from alpha missions for canonical human proteins for a more comprehensive analysis when you visualize the predicted structures. So here, you can toggle between PLDT, which is the local confidence score, and the um, average alpha missions pathogenicity. And we are now going to see it in action. So for a more detailed analysis, we incorporated this heat map, which is interactive. So you can zoom in and out. You can select one residue and see the environment in the 3D viewer. You can also filter the data on the heat map by categories and customize the range if you want to focus on something else. These features enable the examination of the missions varying at the residue level in the context of the 3D structure for the predicted protein. So it's offering you an insight into the broader implications of a specific residue changes and for the part of the heat map, we show the pathogenicity scores and the um, category for the different, for the 19 um, missions variants for a specific residue. You can also down, download the data to re replicate the heat map. This is a C CSV file 
and includes each possible amino acid substitution within the protein, the scores, and the classifications. We also added the um, pathogenicity scores for the two genome built, the HG19 and HG38, which includes all the possible missing single nucleotide variants across the um, reference genome with the specific genomic positions. Last but not least, if you make use of our APIs, you can also retrieve the data from here. And this is how we have added the data from alpha meters into these resources from Emble EBI for the broader community to make use of them. Just as a reminder, all this data provided here is available for commercial and scientific use. And we do encourage you to cite the relevant resource from where the data was taken alongside the original paper from Alpha Missions. So with that, we can now move to the Q&A session. Hello, thank you very much to all of our panelists, especially our speakers for the webinar today. Uh, so we have one question which is in, in the open tab right now. Uh, I can read it. I think it's, it's about the uh, gain of function variant uh, that you uh, mentioned, Joshua, in one of your uh, limitations slide. The ACGS 2024 variant classification guidelines state that REVEL scores do not perform well for all genes. For example, uh, in the case of PKD1, DSG2, and genes where the mechanism is gain of function. So it's uh, personal communications from ACGS uh, laboratories. Has this been investigated for alpha missense? Uh, yeah, so as I addressed in the limitation slide, um, alpha missense uh, performance on gain of function hasn't been systematically validated yet. Um, I found a few vignettes. For example, if you look closely at the paper, um, there's a particular protein, um, GCK, that has some interesting gain of function variants that end up being pathogenic, uh, but those aren't predicted well in alpha mis sense. Um, so if there's a uh, if there's a very systematic way to assess the gain of function performance, um, that'd be actually pretty beneficial for our knowledge as well. Also jumping in myself, I've heard like I've seen some um, analysis from people saying that it doesn't perform that well on gain of function, so I would not like recommend use certain for gain of function variants. So recommend to use it more for loss of function variants. Um, and yeah, gain of functions variant seems to be, you know, uh, more than an open problem um, in the field. So alpha missions, I wouldn't say addresses it. That's a good question. I think also someone submitted an e-letter at the bottom uh, uh, to, to the science um, manuscript that we posted. Um, and I don't know exactly how to link out to that, but if you look at the science website for alpha missense, you can find the those authors response. And those are independent authors who took a look at the scores themselves. There are a couple of uh, comments, uh, questions um, from individuals that came um, uh, inquiring about the performance of alpha missense, uh, specifically on the shorter like peptide uh, type of sequences. And we, uh, Jika has responded and we are quite curious like what use cases um, people have in mind. And so wonder if the group wants to elaborate a little bit on that or ask that question again, um, that would be great. Thanks. And in the meantime, I can jump in and answer uh, some of the uh, questions that, that arise. So um, Dolce asked, what's the limit on protein length? Uh, I think it's the length is fairly similar to alpha fold. Um, I think it's, you know, I think we can fit a like 2000 or something. Like, I, I don't know the exact number, but around, uh, you know, a few, a few thousand. And But then you need to do extra tricks if you want it to go longer. Um, I don't know the number exactly on top of my head. I would recommend to look at the paper, but I think we were able to make predictions for all of the proteins. If if it's longer, then we need to chop it up. So there's technically no limit on the protein length, but we need to chop it up into sub chunks, basically. Um, is there a similar way to study viral variants and mutations? Um, yes, we've seen that the model performs uh, decently, um, also on viral proteins. Although we don't know whether this is just because they're homologous to human proteins or, or not. Um, we haven't made predictions available for non-human proteins. So if you're interested in these, I'd recommend you to reach out to alphamissions at google.com. Um, and 
if there are no other questions, I'm happy to just look through through the answers I've given and, and provide some some more context. Um, there were a few questions around indels um, and whether you can do um, multi predict multiple variants. Um, while we haven't released those predictions, um, technically you could make predictions for multiple variants by replacing the reference sequence with what you would insert the alternative alleles into the reference sequence. Uh, and then you'd look at for all but one variant, and then you'd look at the predictions for the last variant you've you've added, and you could do that in a in a sequence basically. So technically you could do that. We don't know how good the performance is on on epistasis because we haven't sort of systematically studied this. And on indels, I think it's it's a bit tricky with these multiple sequence alignment methods because you need to line up the sequences, and then if you have an indel, how do you line it up there? Um, so I'm pretty sure we could hack it together somehow, but I don't think it's it's going to be very principled. So I'd recommend people to use more of like uh, the sequent language models uh, for these for these tasks. And on short proteins, um, as Elisa said before, if you have any specific use cases in mind, let us know. We have not specifically evaluated the performance on those. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know um, about that. Um, and other organisms as well. We haven't systematically studied the performance on other organisms because our focus has been on the human proteome. Um, so if you have good benchmarks on, on how we can evaluate the performance on in other organisms beyond, say, the DMS data sets, um, let, let us know. Um, and I think these are these are some of the, the major questions. And then there was a question around protein-protein interactions. So alpha missense doesn't predict uh, any specific biochemical. Um, properties. There's a really nice paper from Pedro Beltrao's group uh, that sort of tries to decompose the predictions into different functional um, consequences. I highly recommend people to look at those um, as well. That's something I I I, I, um, um, I forgot to mention. Um, how to use alpha missense tool uh, for a new protein? Um, you'd need to email us basically because we haven't unfortunately released the, the weights. So you need to email us for for that. Uh so the next question is, if I want to study a protein reported to be carcinogenic in breast cancer, I'm using uh, CBIO portal and GDC databases. How can I link between the reported mutations in them and alpha missense? I, I can take this one. So there are two coordinates that we provide. One is the coordinate with the, within the Uniprot protein. So you get the Uniprot ID, the protein uh, amino acid position within the protein, and then the reference and alternative amino acids. So you if you have that one, you can use that one. Alternatively, we also provide the genome coordinates for HG19 and HG38, uh, which specify the chromosome, the position in the in the chromosome, and the um, reference to alternative um, base pair. If you have any of these two, then you can just join in. The you can download the table of predictions and then join in on these um, identifiers. Could alpha missense be used on truncated proteins? I think that's a similar question to indels, so unlikely. Um, but yeah, it would be we'd need to yeah tweak it um, much more than we have done. So next one is more, um, I think, a question about reason behind uh, what makes it harder for alpha missense to predict pathogenicity for gain of function variants. That's a very interesting question. Uh, I'm mostly gonna guess with with, with my answers here, but. Um, there are two sources of information that that alpha missense uses. One is um, evolutionary history of of you know multiple sequence alignments and the structural context. Um, and I guess the constrained um, I'd assume that things that are constrained are more likely um, so that the 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 um, loss of function doesn't happen basically if you if you mutate it because I guess it's maybe more likely to break things than to introduce a new function uh, once you have sort of evolved the protein. So that's why maybe the proportion of um, changes that are conserved are more likely to be more of loss of function type rather than the gain of function type. So that means if the model is looking at evolutionary information, then probably those are you know better predictors of uh, loss of function. And for gain of function, um, maybe the similar argument applies to little frequencies. Maybe these are just a, a more prevalent case. Um, when, when, when we fine tune the model on predicting which variants are frequent in the population and which ones are, done, are not. Um, but I don't have a very good answer on this one. I would you know, I'd be very curious if somebody has a better answer on, on, on this one. Um, it's a very profound question.
Okay, uh, so next one is how reliable is it for membrane proteins? Um, we haven't looked specifically into this category, um, but I would not be surprised if it's quite reliable because I guess there's a lot of evolutionary um, conservation. So because AlphaFold can sort of imp implicitly assume the that the membrane is there, even though you have not fit, like conditioned the model specifically because it sort of infers that from the evolutionary history. Um, so I think for loss of function, I think it's probably good. Um, but yeah, we haven't looked at specific stratification for membrane proteins, not that I would know. Uh, can it be applied to conjugated proteins? Um, I, I guess in general, the, the application of alpha sense for the user's perspective is going to be limited by the fact that it's really that the scores are available rather than the model. Um, so yeah, I, I kind of focus on that, I suppose. Yeah, and, and fundamentally, um, I, I don't think at this, at, you know, at this case, you can go beyond anything else than an amino acid sequence as an input. Um, so any other modifications or, or anything uh, you can't enter at the moment. Uh, with AlphaFold three, maybe you know, this is something we can consider for the future, but um, we don't have an answer at this point. Thank you. Uh, so I'll read the next question. Is it possible to visualize the interaction of two proteins in AlphaFold while also having the alpha missense annotation? Um, we, as Josh mentioned before, we have not released the, the parameters of the model, so this is not possible um, to, to be done by the users. Um, and also AlphaFold 2 was technically trained only on single chains, although people, some people have sort of hacked it and provided the, you know, the linker trick to sort of simulate the protein-protein interactions. We have not looked specifically more extensively into that, but that's maybe something we can uh, look into in the future. It's a, it's a good question. Okay, now it's about the future prediction. So what would you expect in the next version of this tool? I would, I'd love to know the answer of this question. I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. We don't have anything to share at this point, uh, neither on, on AlphaFold 3, we, we, don't, we don't know. Um, obviously, AlphaFold 3 is, is, uh, is a really nice model uh, that can incorporate many other um, biological um, molecules, such as DNA or, or small molecules. Um, so, you know, you could think about conceptually a similar approach, but, you know, we don't have anything to share at this point. Yeah, I guess I guess worth also uh, of communicating that we will always continue to find ways to improve further AlphaMessence. Um, but there's no plans at the moment. So if you have any feedback for us, please do reach out to us because we would love to hear from you. Right. Uh, the next one is, if I have a good understanding, it was said that it was a logistic regression that was used, but have you tried other machine learning approach, random forest regressor, et cetera? Uh, so um, I guess you're referring to the calibration. Um, so during calibration, we... So obviously the fundamental model is a neural network architecture. I just want to be clear about that, is that when we're developing alpha missense, we fine tune AlphaFold, and AlphaFold is a neural network. So the fundamental, it's a neural network approach. But when we calibrated the score to be able to interpret the predictions as the probability of the variant being pathogenic, we used a very simple approach with just two parameters, the slope and the intercept, to um, essentially recalibrate the predictions from alpha missense. Uh, and the reason why we have went with a, such a simple approach is because we've, we've done that calibration on the validation set and we didn't want it to further overfit the model because we just wanted to recalibrate it. So we purposefully went with the, you know, the simplest possible with, approach with the fewest possible parameters. What factors are put in consideration for the determination of pathogenicity scores? Are the factors exhaustive enough? Yeah, that's a great question. The short answer is definitely not comprehensive enough. Um, so the factors are, as Josh mentioned, um, structure of the protein as predicted by AlphaFold. So we, we use that to sort of build up the intuition and as well as multiple sequence alignments to infer the um, evolutionary constraint on the protein. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's obviously two important pieces of information, but they're not comprehensive. For example, we don't input the, if you have a protein-protein interaction, we don't input what the other partner would be or if you have a protein binding on the DNA. So there's not, there's not a lot of uh, extra context uh, provided in terms of, um, you know, the specific function of the protein. But I guess the, 
the challenge there is that it hinges on the question of protein function, which is, I'd see it as a tip of the iceberg that sort of expands on lots of other questions. The most fundamental being, if you have a protein, which proteins does it actually interact with? And I, I don't think we have a complete protein-protein interaction uh, graph to date yet or, or, or an, another thing. So it's a, it's a sort of tip of the iceberg questions. And yeah, definitely as we gain a better understanding of the function of proteins, we, we hopefully can potentially start inputting more of these kinds of informations into predictors. But I think we have a very long way to go for this. Okay, so next one is which pathogenic score is more reliable, for instance, SIFT, CAD, polyphen, or anything else? So the short answer is else, and the else equals alpha missense. <laughs> okay. <Yes. laughs> okay, all right. Uh, I can link out to some benchmarking studies as well. Um, that would help with that answer. Um, uh, have you evaluated alpha missense on other gold standard data sets, such as HGMD? Um, we didn't have access to the HGMD. It's quite expensive for uh, for commercial companies like us to, to apply for. Uh, so we didn't have access. Um, if somebody wants to evaluate, if somebody has access and would like to evaluate the model on this, they can do so by downloading our scores. But we went with the um, openly available Canvas so that others can also reproduce uh, the results. So what about the new version of CAD? Um, obviously, it's hard to keep up with all the developments, and it's a very, very active field. And at some point, you know, you have to uh, stop and submit the paper. Um, and you know that's the best we can do is to make our scores available for the community so that they can sort of evaluate and compare methods on an ongoing basis. And I, you know, very warmly welcome this because I think this is going to bring the science forward and gain us understanding of where methods perform well and where they don't. So I don't know. I, we probably haven't used the most recent version of CAD uh, in this, but um, we're you know, we're quite happy with the performance of AlphaMessence overall. Um, so um, yeah, I think it's. It's going to be harder and harder to make uh, strong improvements without maybe bringing some something you know conceptually very new into the game. All right. Uh, thank you for the wonderful webinar. I'm curious about your thoughts on the relationship uh, between evolutionary sequence constraint, sequence conservation, and site evolution rate. Could you elaborate on how these factors interact with one another? That's a good question. I don't know, actually. So this is like a, up to the neural network to sort of figure it out. We have not... Like we have not done like an extensive decomposition of model predictions in terms of what exactly, what kinds of feature it's pulling out of multiple sequence alignment. Um, so just as a reminder, um, alpha fold and alpha missions get as input the multiple sequence alignment in form of a, a, a 3D matrix, which is, you know, number of residues by amino acids by number of sequences. And then a neural network is applied to compute pairwise correlations between columns and then also do attention across columns and rows of this. Um, so the, in some way, it is sort of gathering these kinds of pieces of information, like what is the average, uh, cons like what is the uh, like the entropy, for example, at this given position and so forth. But we don't exactly know how like how they get decomposed and what's the relative contribution because it's all sort of um, entangled inside the neural network. Uh, I, I actually it's, I don't know how one could sort of decompose those. I'd be you know interested if you have any ideas on this one. Do you have any plan to share alpha missions model for developers? Um, no explicit plans, but uh, you know I do do hope that um, you know um, we'd be able to do this um, at, at at some point, but no like no explicit plans on this one. Did you look at ensembles of uh, different methods? If so, can that give any meaningful improvement? Do different methods to some extent make uncorrelated errors? Um, we we've we've only tried uh, doing ensembling with some of the best performing methods, such as Eve and so forth. And for these, we didn't see a, a, a significant improvement, possibly because they're all sort of based on very similar features. Like Eve is also trained on multiple sequence alignments, uh, and so forth. But so maybe we need to do something else. Um, you know, the, the community can explore these questions now that the scores are are available. Um, so you know, you could you could try out uh, doing this. Uh, I, the only thing I'd caution is don't uh, like don't really combine it with little frequencies because these these should be sort of held out and used separately as part of the ASMG guidelines. So um, that would be one feature I would sort of advise against using, as well as don't use other predictors that have potentially trained on the data set you want to evaluate because you're going to be leaking information. So you have to be very careful when ensembling to make sure that your held out set is truly held out. 
and with alpha missions, we've held out all the amino acid positions that are from ClinVar to make sure that there's sort of no um, crosstalk between allele frequencies we fine tuned on and, and the performance on ClinVar. So that's, that's just a point of caution if somebody wants to do this. Okay, uh, so next one is uh, one problem with score is the non explainability of the result. Could it be possible to obtain a more verbal <laughs> answer if the variant modelized breaks some energy link or solvent accessibility stuff like that? Yeah, I, I think the, the problem, that's a very good question, John. I think uh, I'd point you to the um, uh, Pedro's paper that I posted earlier. Um, I think it's probably the best we have so far. The the challenge there is that we don't we lack those labels for for fine tuning uh, for fine tuning these models, right? All we have are sort of computational methods, and then you know if we if we train our model to make predictions of the, another computational model, then we just sort of be bootstrapping ourselves without making a sort of a novel injection of knowledge. Um, so I do think that the experimental efforts to specifically measure bio, biochemical or biophysical properties of, of amino acid changes are really important and I'm you know cheering very heavily for the experimental community to generate the um, the large data sets that are going to be required for us to train models on these more verbose uh, predictions. As a neural network one could determine uh, determine the variable importance which is the top variable of importance in this model? Yeah, that's a good question. So the variable importance uh, analysis becomes somewhat challenging if your inputs are sort of very raw, in this case, you know, just multiple sequence alignments, because these are not well-defined features. Um, so when you're, we haven't done any sort of input gradients or attribution analysis to, to study these. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know, actually. Um, I think the, the best probably, uh, one thing you could do is just maybe just take the Although what, what we have done, so in, in, in genomics, for example, for DNA models, people do want something called in silico mutagenesis, where um, you know you sim systematically mutate all the possible um, nucleotides in the input sequence, and then you see if there are any motifs that pop up. Um, we've done this, right? We've released the protein-wide uh, predictions of these. So you could, you could see if there is like local regions or motifs that get highlighted and overlap these maybe with annotations. So that's one way in which you could sort of decompose the model prediction. So you could maybe see if there's like um, some binding motifs or, or some other features on, on proteins. That's one way in which you could study this. But um, like decomposing it into sort of raw features on multiple sequence lines, that's that's quite challenging, I would say. Um, and you know, I've, I haven't seen this done much for these kinds of models. Um, AlphaFold had a really nice interpretation uh, method where they've trained the structure prediction head at different layers in the, in the network. Um, because we're only predicting a scalar, that's, you know, to, to go back to, to the verbose predictions, it's it's kind of hard to understand what, what the model is thinking about because all you're, you're left is a single number between 0 and 1. So you could do this approach, but it would be harder to interpret as, as for AlphaFold. As a slight aside, there's also an ablation study um, that you can look at in the paper to guide your intuition on which model components were more or less important for training. Not exactly the answer to that question, but something to think about uh, looking at after the webinar. If not, uh, I would like to thank everyone for, for joining the webinar uh, today. And I'd like to thank our, our panel, especially all the speakers and everyone who, who helped in answering the questions. Um, and I would like to say, explore all the uh, MBLE BI resources which were mentioned today, like uh, AlphaFold database, uh, Uniprot, Ensemble, and Decipher. They are the best use cases of, of for instance, predictions. You, you can explore all the data. So go there and explore that. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank you.